Voilà, bonsoir à, à toutes et tous. Oh, sorry, I should switch to, to English. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you had a very nice uh, moment watching this, uh, this uh, documentary, very interesting one. Uh, in many aspects, it will serve as a, as a basis for, for our discussion tonight with our panelists. Um, as you've heard in the movie, the idea of connecting the brain um, to the machine, if we can say, is not new. It dates back to the late uh, 90s. But I'm sure that you might have uh, read or heard the news recently that um, uh, this technology has been put um, under the light again um, with the news around Elon Musk's Neuralink company who wants to, to merge the, the brain and arti uh, artificial intelligence which certainly is tainted uh, with some hype and we actually also tried to sort hype from reality tonight uh, in this in this panel uh, during this debate we'll go also much beyond the historical aspects of uh, the concretiza concretization of this uh, brain machine interfaces and after considering uh, in some way and we'll see how far um, that we can indeed uh, connect the brain to some machine um, and that we can actually read the brain, or maybe modulate the brain, many question arises. What does it mean, for example, to read the brain um, concretely? To what level of, of complexity can we read thoughts? Who is allowed to do that? And for what purposes, for example? Who actually owns the data that are produced by those brain-computer interfaces? And before that, uh, what could be done with those, da those data? Uh, and when we talk about biological data, w what shall we care about to, to protect those data or not? Does it even go further uh, and have impact on our human rights? And what are the ethical questions? For example, who of the non-disabled or non-seek people should have access to those emerging neurotechnologies to possibly, for example, enhance the brain? And there we go to the very hypey word that is in the title of this conference tonight, uh, transhumanism, right? And we can even go further to f philosophical questions. If you recall the, um, the words by Philip Kennedy in the movie, he said at some point, patients uh, having regained a communication channel or speech told him, it makes me feel human again. So it's kind of a paradox here. So we'll try to go through all those uh, questions tonight. But before that, let me um, first present myself. My name is uh, Olivier Desibo. I'm a former science journalist, and now I'm a science communicator for a foundation in Geneva called GESDA, which stands for Geneva Science and Diplomacy Anticipator. It's a foundation dedicated to try to anticipate what will come um, in science in the next years, and also try to accompany those um, advances with the from the onset, from, uh, from the very beginning, with the right framework um, of public and political discussions and, and regulations. Um, with me tonight, I have the great pleasure to welcome three panelists, two on stage and one online. On stage, I have the great pleasure to have Olaf Blanquet. He's a medical doctor, a neurologist, neuroscientist. He's holding now the Bertarelli uh, Foundation Chair in Cognitive Neuroprosthetics at EPFL, but not in Lausanne, here in Geneva at the campus biotech. Online, um, I can see her on my screen and you will on yours. There she is. We can welcome uh, Nita Farahani. She's professor of law and philosophy at Duke University. And she's a uh, specialist in the ramifications of new technologies for society, law, and ethics. And in 2010, she was appointed by President Barack Obama to the Presidential Commission for the Study of Bioethical Issues in the United States. And next to me, I have um, Marcelo Yenka. He is a, a researcher at the Faculty of Social and Human Sciences at EPFL, uh, also giving le uh, lectures at ETH Zurich. He's a, he's a specialist in ethics and biomedical data and emerging technologies concerning the human computer interfaces. Is that correct? Yes. So we roughly have uh, an hour to, to discuss, um, based on the documentary that you've seen, the, the neurotechnologies and the impacts and the, the rights that, that go with that. I will have a first batch of questions for the, for the panelists. And then, of course, as you know, we'll open the, the floor for questions uh, to you. Uh, 
and I've been told that you can even ask your question in French, in French because there's simul simultaneous translation uh, here for us. I don't know if it's the case for you, but at least for us on stage, um, uh, if you feel like you prefer to ask your question in French, please do so and uh, you will have the translation um, uh, online for us here. So I'll start with, with you, Olaf, um, and maybe um, reset the, the basis around what what we mean when we are talking about neurotechnology. So could you briefly summarize what we understand under that word, maybe the, the categories that are in it, because there are some categories and so on, and maybe give some, some examples. So what do we understand? Because, uh, for example, coffee might be called a, a neurotechnology because it modulates our brain as well. Uh, when we take coffee, we're more alert, etc. So can we go as far as uh, calling coffee a neurotechnology? Or do you restrict your definition to to a more uh, uh, you know narrow view of the of the topic? Yeah, maybe maybe to get started. Uh, uh, good evening, uh, first of all. Maybe to get started. Uh, yeah, neurotechnology is really an interface of brain sciences or neurosciences, including psychology, with the field of technology and engineering. So in that sense, maybe coffee, maybe I'll come back to it later, is, is not really a key part of that first definition, but really think about four different fields of academia, neuroscience, engineering, computer science, and medicine. And think about neurotechnology as sort of breaking down those silos and really working closely together with, um, with um, one of the goals being to understand the brain, but also to interfere with the brain, as you've seen an example, and also help coming up with novel treatments for the brain. In that sense, you can see coffee more as an as a alimentary chemical uh, that, of course, also interferes with the brain. Just speaking in this way, we're somehow changing our brains. I'm definitely changing mine, and I know definitely, even if you're listening or not, there's changes in your brain. So there's really no limits, if you want, if you put coffee into it, then just speaking is a neurotechnology within that definition. Even education, maybe in, 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 in the school, right, is very much a brain change. But so I think we want to speak more, not about coffee, maybe not even about pharmacology, but neurotechnology. So typical type of engineering, think about a device like in the film that we've just seen, and how can this relationship between brain and technology evolve, and 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 what is possible today? I, I, I maybe let's let's start like this. It doesn't have to be invasive. In the film, we saw invasive neurotechnologies, but there are other others as well. So over the last two decades, actually, so there's invasive uh, neurotechnologies, and then there's non-invasive ones, uh, particularly in 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 the frontier of investigating and, and dealing with human brains and understanding human brains and measuring them, there is a range of new technologies that have come across. You've all heard about scanners, brain scanners. Um, there is electrical brain signals that can be measured. There's non-invasive brain stimulation tools, so where you can change the activity of, of, of focal brain systems by applying weak currents. So those are all and there's a whole other range of, of technologies. So really there's a big classification or difference between non-invasive, uh, for example here in Geneva at Campus Biotech, uh, many of the studies that are carried out are done by these uh, uh, non-harmful um, technologies that can be applied in everyone, and then there is more harmful invasive uh, procedures, um, harmful in the sense if they're not properly applied, but of course these are very important tools in, in, in medicine. And just when we were sitting downstairs, one very typical example that is not at all mentioned in the film, but which is already a brain or nerve implant would be a cochlear implant. So hearing people who are born deaf or people who are deaf, many people worldwide, several hundred thousands, have such implants in their inner ear nerves, for example. So that would be one key example of what is very frequently used today. And I think in, uh, in, in Swiss Romandie, in Western Switzerland, it's within the first year if you're born deaf, deaf and, and you, you want your child to follow normal schooling, that, that is a, a procedure that's proposed. There's a lot of buzz currently around this, this Neuralink technology by Elon Musk. You might have read that. He wants to, well, 
merge um, the brain with artificial in intelligence, have exchanges both ways, etc. He wants to read the brain, read thoughts, and we even saw in the movie that Stephen Hawking um, kind of accepts to have a, w would have accepted to have a brain implant, but without this implant being able to read his, his thoughts. So where do we stand? I mean, where do you put the cursor in I between the hype um, of merging the brain and AI and, and reading uh, signals or, you know, curves, etc. cetera? Where, where I mean, where do you put the cursor in, in terms of reading thoughts? Yeah, may, may, maybe two responses. One, for sure, we are living through an absolutely incredible, uh, incredible period. I, I mean, you, you're all aware, computer uh, science and artificial intelligence is really everywhere. So, linked to the brain, of course, as well. Then there are over the last two decades these amazing advances we have seen in neuroscience, because again, there were new technologies allowing us for the first time to study the healthy human brain in action. This was just not possible. Uh, let's say 20 years ago. So the coming together of those two parts, again, computer science, AI, neuroscience, but also medicine and engineering. I think the engineering plus AI is really the most novel part, and that's really, I think it, it couldn't be hyped too much. I think we're all expecting a lot from it. There's a lot of diseases where after two generations of research, we just have no cure. Alzheimer's disease or stroke, we can make. Alzheimer's disease, over 100 years ago, the disease was, was, was defined. We still today, with I don't know how many trillions of, of, of euros and Swiss francs of funding, we, we, we don't have a solution. So there is a lot of hope that maybe with AI and engineering this can be achieved. So in one, one of my responses, well, there is not enough hype. We really have to try to do something in that direction and maybe also advance brain understanding. At the same time, one has to, of course, also be on the, um, how to say, maybe more conservative side and really present the data, hmm. what is possible today. So what is possible? Poss because we know we can read thoughts to, to direct a robotic arm, for example. This has been done for 16 years now. But still, uh, can we read philosophical thoughts, for example? Well, well, you could say, for example, those. To, if you take a, a patient like you've seen in the movie, like a tetraplegic patient who is not able to to make movements like this to the to the glass. I think there was this one example in there. Um, well, this is trained in that patient over and over again, over days, over weeks, and that's the result the patient has. So amazing to have that movement, but how far are we from that patient being independent at home? So this is a long way to go, to go from these lab experiments in very few subjects to a system that works for everyone, or to decode language, or, or, or other capabilities, right? So, and this is with the most sophisticated um, invasive technology with different electrodes, with more electrodes that are available uh, than are, that are available today compared to what, what, what Phil Kennedy um, um, was using. And then if you think about reading, uh, uh, I think reading the mind by non-invasive technologies, again, this can be done in laboratory environments, but to map any of our brain states on a millisecond and second to second basis is, is not possible today. What about writing? into the brain, because this is reading, but can we also, or will we be able, and what, writing information to the brain? So two clinical examples to start. So cochlear implant, again, we're literally writing sound signals into the, not into the brain, but into the auditory nerve, into the hearing nerve, and that is written into the brain if you, if you want. It's a very sparse code, but the brain is able to, to learn with it, uh, to, to, to hear with that information. Um, in Parkinson's disease, there's over 100,000 patients worldwide who also have signals written into a particular part of the brain. So writing uh, electrical signals into the brain means there is an electrode. Think about a pacemaker for the heart, but it's a pacemaker for a particular structure in the brain. So this, this is also possible today. Again, hundreds uh, of thousands of, of patients. But uh, you know, those would be two clinical examples. Then writing into the brain without implanting an electrode, without this invasive medic medical procedure, the effects are very weak, I would say. So there are effects, but these effects, again, are in a laboratory environment. They're over a large group of subjects. Let's say all of us participate in a study, and then for all of us there is an effect. 
under certain conditions. So again, it would not work for the three of us probably in the same way. And, and what about memory? Because that's the big hype. You mentioned the hype before. I mean, this idea of, of writing information, not only a signal that could correct the tremor of uh, a Parkinson's uh, disease uh, 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 a patient, but really information as, as it is, uh, like numbers or like whatever. Yeah, so uh, I mean, <coughs> fascinating for the neuroscientist to write memories into the brain, of course, a fascinating opportunity also to understand memory and how it works in the brain. At the same time, I mentioned the Alzheimer's example, the typical function that is lost is, of course, memory, remembering the names, remembering the faces, remembering that we're sitting in Geneva in a particular place in Rue de Carouge at the moment. So all these things are gone. So if one would be able to help by helping certain systems in the brain, like for Parkinson's disease, to help with movement, to have another stimulation in a different brain region under certain conditions to help. Memory is a dream, but we are not there yet. But memory is, for example, uh, there are several projects ongoing where, where this is tried again via invasive uh, recordings. So let me turn to you, Nita. Um, before we all fall asleep, <laughs> and no, well, it's not it's not night time for you. It's uh, it's daytime. Um, no, um, so th these are good examples and 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 potential therapies, right? Uh, treating Parkinson's or Alzheimer's disease, but things could could go wrong uh, also. So what are what could be the pitfalls? What what are the risks in all this? What could go wrong? How could those neurotechnologies could be used uh, improperly, if I can say? Well, let me start by saying um, when we're talking about mind reading, I think it's useful to be more broadly minded. Um, and, and by that, I mean, of course, today we cannot do things like read um, complex thoughts or philosophical thoughts, as you mentioned. But we can do things that are reading our minds in more um, discrete ways, like I can tell if somebody is, is tired or falling asleep or entering into microsleep. I can tell if a person is experiencing certain kinds of emotions um, and that might be very useful in making predictions or deciding how I'm going to calibrate my response if I know those things. I may, for example, know, um, uh, you know basic words or images that are in a person's mind if I have more sophisticated technology and algorithms that can decode what that information means. And I might even be able to do things like figure out kinds of information that are concealed in the brain. Um, and by that I mean uh, whether or not you recognize certain images or if you um, recognize certain names. Like for example, suppose I want to know if you're a terrorist and part of the reason, part of the way that I'm going to do that is figuring out if you know things that you shouldn't know, if your brain signals recognition of a person's name or um, certain words, uh, certain chemicals, things like that, that you really should have no reason to know. Those are all potential things that I can decode today using very um, almost unsophisticated technology in some ways, consumer based technology. So, what are the things that could go wrong? So, first, there is huge upsides for this technology, not just for the Parkinson's patient, but for us every day. Um, we might, for example, stop doing things like typing out our text messages and think our response to text messages instead. We might get rid of our keyboard and our mouse and use neurotechnology as the way we interface with other devices, which could be exciting. But as we do that, as we adopt that in a much more wide scale way, um, what that does suddenly is it makes our brains and the data that is in our brains available to people never before possible. Um, and, you know, just a few examples, like in China, for example, um, a few years back, there were uh, some reports in um, a newspaper that talked about how in, in Chinese run state factories, um, workers were being required to wear EEG headsets. Um, very simple headsets that would decode their brain activity to try to tell if they were tired, but also to try to tell if they might introduce some emotional instability into the workplace. Train conductors on the high-speed train line between um, Beijing and Shanghai were required to have their fatigue levels mon monitored. And that can be very promising in that it might decrease the number of accidents that we suffer in society if we can tell that a person is tired, 
But in order to make those determinations, you have to collect a lot more data about the brain. It's not like there's just a little discrete signal that tells us you're tired. You collect what we call raw brainwave activity. And with more sophisticated technology, we can do things like figure out all of the things that I mentioned. And if you're um, somebody who lives in a more oppressive country or regime, you may fear thinking any kind of dissident thought or any thought at all, knowing that that kind of information could be used potentially against you. In a number of primary schools in China, as well as in the US and in other countries, primary school children have been asked to, if not required, to wear headsets that decode their brain activity during their school day to try to tell if they're focused or paying attention. The chilling effect that that can have on a child's development, especially when that information is um, having a red, green, and orange light that signals their focus levels is being fed to the teacher in the front of the classroom, to the parents, but also potentially to the state, um, can be very problematic. Even if the technology can't do what people say it can do, the very fact that people are being required to wear the technology to decode their brain activity can lead to a substantial chilling effect on freedom of thought. So, you know, I think there's great promise, but I think we have never before been able to truly decode what's in our brains. That's been the one space for mental reprieve and privacy. It's been the one space where people can cultivate personality, can have um, fantasies and also have dissident thoughts, can rise up against tyrannical governments by thinking about the oppression that they're suffering. And when suddenly all of that is open to employers, to the state, to parents, um, to your partner, uh, the way which we define our relationships with one another, but also the ways in which people have mental repose and privacy may fundamentally be at risk. In, um, in your TED talk, which is great, I can only recommend it, you mentioned Thank that you. Uh, this idea that we give up on our uh, last bastion of freedom, which you call mental uh, privacy. Can you elaborate on that, please? Yeah, so I think people have largely given up on many other forms of privacy. Now, maybe maybe where you are tonight, people um, are a little bit more interested in privacy than in the United States, where I think they've just truly given up all forms of privacy. People trade their privacy very cheaply um, in order to gain supposedly free access to goods and services, whether that's social media or other things, they're willing to give up a whole lot of their privacy. Um, but that's in a world in which we imagine that there was one space. That one space was mental privacy. Um, and I worry that when people cheaply, freely, and without thought or contemplation give up that one final space, the one space in which you can truly cultivate self, you can think about organizing against a discriminatory um, employer, you can think about uh, you know, what your sexual orientation, your gender identity is, you can start to really have a space where you think um, thoughts about creating or solving some of the big mysteries in society, but you do so by daring to have a thought that you're not ready to share with other people. When you don't have that space, when we give up that one space, when we give access to other people, that space without the kind of reflection that we really need to have about what is that space doing in our interrelationships in humanity? How are we developing and cultivating our relationships with one another? How do we define intimacy in a world in which it's no longer up to you what you share with another person, but it may be something that is just as easily taken and treated like all of the rest of our data. I worry that that's truly our last bastion of freedom and that we will give that up without really reflecting on it and recognizing that it is something special, it is something different. Um, it's part of a continuum, it is part of the complete dossier that people are creating about a person, but there is this one piece missing from that dossier, which is this space of private mental reprieve. And when we give that away, I worry that we have given up something fundamental about what it means to be human. And actually, you, you, you led a study about this. You, you ask people how far they were aware of that, right? And um, yes. the, the results yes, were so astonishing. And I, I think it would be great that you kind of share the, what you asked the people f for and what the results were. 
Yeah. So there, there's a, um, a survey company that's based in the United States, Pew Research, um, who has done a tremendous amount of research about people's attitudes. And one of the studies that they did a number of years ago and that they've repeated since was to try to get a sense of how people rank different pieces of information about themselves with respect to how sensitive or private they think that information is. Um, and we decided to run that same study again, but to add um, a number of pieces of information that we can now get from your brain. Things from your attention and focus to the more complex things that we can't yet obtain, like your complex thoughts and the mental images in your mind and being able to decode that information. And we asked people to rate that information along with the other pieces of information that Pew had already tested before um, and to tell us how sensitive they, they think that was. What was utterly shocking to us was the results, um, which was the single piece of information that people thought was the most sensitive information was their social security number, um, which has been breached and stolen every way to Sunday uh, in, in the United States. Um, but was a, what was amazing to us was that was far more sensitive than the thoughts in their mind or the images in their mind. Um, and on the one hand, we might think that's because people simply don't understand what the implications of this new technology are, that they don't realize that if I could truly decode your thoughts, I can decode your social security number and a whole lot more. Um, but in turn, it turns out that in follow-up studies, we tested that theory that perhaps they don't believe that the technology can do these things. And in fact, they do. They believe the technology can do these things, and they still think that their social security number is far more sensitive. And I think the reason that is, is because we've done a very good job in the United States of helping people to understand that social security number helps safeguard you against identity theft. But we haven't yet really educated people about what the potential harms and misuse are that can occur when we start to be able to access um, brain tech, you know, what's happening in the brain, the thoughts, the images, even the simpler things like emotions um, in the mind. And so I, I think what that tells us is that people really need to start to be educated about what the potential risks are, and that by educating people about those potential risks, we can start to safeguard ourselves so that we can reap the benefits. Because as I said, there is tremendous potential upside, but only if the technology progresses in a way that's within the context of rights and protections for individuals. So at least the, the scientists were aware of that because uh, a new concept has appeared in the last uh, uh, years, not days, years, uh, a concept called neuro rights. Um, and we have here an expert on, on that concept, uh, Marcello Yenka. Can you tell us more? What, what does this concept encompass? Sure. And um, thanks, Olivier. If you allow me, I just wanted to say that um, by starting this conversation, it's very important that we are having this discussion about the human rights implications of neurotechnology and emerging technologies. But as we speak, uh, the fundamental human rights of millions of Ukrainians are being um, violated. And it's important that we emphasize this at the beginning just to, to point out that war is probably the most systematic degradation of human rights that uh, humans have invented. Um, now, this doesn't mean that we should consider the human rights implications of new technologies as a secondary concern. And this is the reason why some people like Nita and I and many other colleagues have been um, developing this uh, thought along the lines of discussing what uh, human rights people are entitled to exercise in relation to their brain and mind domain. And the idea behind this stems from the fact that, as we heard from all of, um, the brain is not just a, a, an organ like any other, um, but it's the fundamental site of uh, uh, fundamental life-maintaining processes, like respiration and so on, but also um, psychological faculties, such as mental states and processes. So every thought you ever had, um, every, everything you've ever felt, everything you've ever seen or heard, um, every memory you've ever heard, everything you've ever said, um, all these activities are, at some point, the product of neurons firing in your brain. So the prospect of uh, reading out from the brain and writing into the brain opens the prospect of influencing these um, processes that are what makes us fundamentally humans. 
Um, so there are many definitions of neural rights. Uh, of neural rights. I, I recently um, re uh, finished uh, writing a report for the Council of Europe, uh, and the definition there is very boring and long. So I think we can make it, with some degree of simplification, uh, more more um, acceptable for general audience, and say that the, it's the core set of human rights um, that concerns the brain and mind of human beings. And maybe by, uh, it can be also useful to say what human right, uh, neural rights are not, because um, that, I think, um, can avoid some conceptual confusion. Uh, at least from my point of view, neural rights are not the rights of the brain, of, as uh, many um, media outlets have written, because um, it does not make any sense, in my view, to ascribe rights to an individual organ, however important as the brain is. Um, the human person is uh, the ultimate subject of rights. Um, and also, neural rights are um, not necessarily all about neurotechnology. Um, and uh, here I'm echoing something, something that Anita has already mentioned. And probably I'm partly responsible for using the prefix neural rights in the, in the definition, uh, because you don't necessarily need to have direct access to the brain either by uh, writing into the brain or by reading from the brain in order to influence uh, mental activity in any significant sense. Um, so today we have a lot of technologies that have a way higher degree of uh, uh, societal penetration, like smartphones um, and the social media and approaches to artificial intelligence called effective computing that can, in principle, generate a much higher degree of information from your mental states than any other neurotechnology can at the current stage of de development of this technology. But unless we believe that there is something magic in the human mind, that it's some kind of you know immaterial thing that it was infused into our body by God, uh, but if we believe that the mind is enabled by the brain, which is the common uh, the, the common, uh, we can say, paradigm within neuroscience and modern neuroscience, then the more we can l learn about the brain, the more we can learn about the mind. The more we can read from the brain, we, the more we can read about the mind. So in some sense, we are living in very exciting times, and here I totally agree with, uh, with Olaf, um, because neuroscience is allowing us to do something that was never possible for centuries of science. Uh, it can make the brain naked. Uh, for, for many centuries, uh, the brain was somehow hidden in the skull, and for scientists, it was nearly impossible to study this very important organ. So now we have the ability and technology to understand how the brain works, its anatomy, its function, its activity, um, and we can even have the ability to connect the brain to machines, we, as we, we saw in the movie. So I think this is, uh, we're living in very exciting times, but uh, exciting times also generate exciting ethical challenges. And one of those is precisely what kind of um, uh, rights people are entitled to exercise. So what form? could those rights take? Is that self-regulation? Is that an international declaration? Is that something added to the existing uh, human rights declaration? What, what co very concretely could, could those neural rights l look like? What form? That's a very important question, because when, when we talk about rights, so rights have um, many semantics. Um, you can talk about rights in the legal sense. Uh, you can talk about rights in the philosophical sense. Um, in my view, neural rights are both. So th there are rights in the philosophical sense, because they are about fundamental ethical norms uh, that uh, should govern the, uh, the, the way we intervene into the brain. But at the same time, uh, a lot of people have argued that neural rights should also be interpreted in a legal sense. And legally, we have uh, multiple options. Um, so uh, one option that has been pursued by some, and we have seen a recent example in, in Chile, is to consider um, neural rights as uh, fundamental human rights as in international human rights law. Um, and so if we follow that path, then the options that we are available 
are to either enshrine them into the international treaties um, that we have or to interpret the rights that are enshrined in international treaties in an evolu evolutionary way. So for example, to, to give you an example, I've recently participated in a hearing of the uh, United Nations um, uh, Rapporteur on Freedom of Thought. And one topic that was discussed there was about whether um, uh, we should interpret freedom of thought in a more literal sense now that we have these technologies. Uh, so the freedom of thought is a right that is already codified in uh, international human rights law. And one way would be to interpret these rights that we already have in this evolutionary way. So y you mentioned it, interpret, and then I give you the word. Yeah? OK, good. Sorry, just one quick question. Uh, Take your mic. One quick question, Marcello. You said Chile. Can you tell us more about this? Why, why Chile? It's, it's very interesting. Can, can you tell us just in two sentences? Um, so what happened in Chile, for those who don't know, is um, that the Senate has recently approved um, um, a new neuroprotection bill, which is the first, to my knowledge, uh, legally binding uh, regulation on the use of neurotechnology. And this uh, regulation introduces a principle of uh, mental integrity, uh, which prevents uh, and forbids the harmful use of neurotechnology. And the interesting thing there is that through uh, the, the advisory work of some expert like uh, Rafael Justo, who is a um, neuroscientist in New York, uh, they uh, introduced this, uh, uh, this regulation as part of a larger constitutional reform because Chile was in the process of reforming their own constitution. So this is one possible path to say new rights should be constitutional rights. On, on the national level, in that case, Chile. But you mentioned interpretation. There's a big debate going on um, on the necessity or not to modify the human rights declaration. Right, and to add maybe a new right, a new right to this uh, declaration or not, and take the declaration as it is and interpret that. So can you tell us more about this? And then I'll also ask you the same question, Nita, because that's often, uh, um, obviously your, your field of competence as well. <laughs> so um, modifying uh, international treaties, uh, international declarations, for example, is, is extremely hard uh, for very good reasons. Um, so one approach that has been, uh, to my knowledge, no, no organization internationally or nationally is attempting to do so. Uh, one thing that is being pursued, for example, within the, the Council of Europe, uh, which is an organization that um, um, promotes human rights in the European space and Switzerland is also a member of, is to add new protocols to the conventions and treaties that they have developed. For example, the Oviedo Convention, which is the one that regulates uh, biomedical technology and biomedical research. And there, um, I have the privilege to, to work together with the Council of Europe, and there, the approach that they're pursuing is to discuss whether we need to add new protocols to this convention. But modifying existing treaties, I, I will defer to, to Nita, who's way more qualified than I am to talk about this. Uh, but um, I, I would be very skeptical that that's the best way to go. Nita? Um, I, I uh, echo, you know, Marcello's concerns about this, but um, one of the ways to think about it is to start by trying to articulate what are the set of concerns and then looking at existing laws to see where and if those concerns can be protected um, and if there are gaps or regulatory gaps that exist. From a constitutional law perspective or, or an international human rights perspective, I don't think that we have any shortage of the principles that we would need in order to govern neurotechnology, um, whether that's freedom of thought or um, informational access, the right to informational access, or you know, rights against certain kinds of alterations to self that um, you know, bioweapons or things like that, that all of the rights that we need exist. What doesn't exist is the theoretical mapping of those rights to neurotechnologies, because um, whenever we have a new lens that we can look at the existing rights with and say, do our existing interpretations keep up with technology? Uh, and the answer would be no in many of these instances. And one good example of that that, that Marcello mentioned is freedom of thought. Um, but there are other examples of that too, including, for example, what constitutes um, you know, torture, what constitutes, uh, you know, inappropriate use of bioweapons 
um, what are uh, what constitutes sensitive data and how it's processed and rights to that data and rights to that processing. And so um, I think probably the most promising approach is to begin by articulating what we mean by it. This is the work that um, that I'm doing that people like Marcello are doing, which is to say, I'm trying to define, for example, what is cognitive liberty? Um, and within cognitive liberty, how do we understand the existing set of human rights that pertain to it? Um, and how do we need to update those in order to make sure that we recognize this concept of cognitive liberty so, that so what maps is it? together many existing human rights? What is it? What do you understand by cognitive liberty, may maybe? Cognitive liberty is the right to self-determination over our brains and our mental experiences. Um, and that includes, for example, within it, the right to access information about our own brains, um, the right to integrity with respect to our mental processes such that they aren't interrupted without our authorization, without our consent, that they aren't altered. Um, it's a right to freedom of thought, um, recognizing that that freedom is a robust freedom, but not an unlimited one. And that's one of the challenges with human rights law is that human rights are absolute and cognitive liberty, like any other kind of liberty, will yield to social interest when they're strong enough, when the common good is at stake. So for example, it may be perfectly appropriate for an employer or for the state to say, if you're a driver of a commercial vehicle, um, we have a right to monitor your fatigue levels. But that wouldn't, for example, cognitive liberty would say, when you do that, you cannot access other information from a person's brain. You can't track or decipher or decode the rest of their mental processes, which don't pertain to whether or not they're fatigued while driving. And so it is looking at this concept of cognitive liberty, the right to self-determination over our brains and mental experiences, mapping existing human rights law, and recognizing where we need to update as Um, as Marcello said, different areas, whether that's regulations or other shortcomings in those interpretations. Just one small example of that. In the United States, um, we have in our U.S. Constitution uh, a right or a privilege against self-incrimination. This is a privilege that exists in many different contexts across the world. It's the right to not have to testify against yourself, to condemn yourself in a criminal proceeding or other kind of proceeding. The way we've interpreted that in the United States until now is to say you can take evidence from a person's body. Like, for example, I could get a DNA sample or a blood sample to see if you are intoxicated, but I can't force you to testify against yourself. Well, what do we think of um, blood flow in the brain or firing of neurons in the brain? Is that physical evidence from the body or is that testifying against oneself? And if you take the literal past interpretations of this, we would say, that's all fair game. But of course, the idea of what it is that we're trying to protect a person against includes those mental processes, the thought, the substantive content. It's just suddenly with technology, we can access it. So we have to update our understanding of how we apply what is a pre-existing principle, which is a right against self-incrimination to understand when new technology allows us to do that in ways we never before thought possible, the right is the same. How we apply it will change as technologies evolve. What does the, the scientist think of this debate? Extremely interesting debate, very relevant. I was I wanted to, to get back to cognitive liberty and, and just mention one, one experiment um, that, um, that we have recently done. I think where this this point was was almost tested, um, and what we were interested in is to test something called the sense of agency. Think about it as having feeling a subjective control over your actions, over your body, but also over your thoughts. And we worked very closely together with um, um, with a person who was tetraplegic, who couldn't move arms nor legs. And he also had an implant, an, uh, a more recent version of the implant that you've seen in the movie. And normally these implants are done very much like you've seen in the movie as well, to, to be able to generate, permit movements so that individuals can, can act out thoughts and, 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 and desires and interact, of course, with other humans and the environment. What we were interested in, in addition to that research dedicated to improving movement, we were interested in the sense of agency, in the sense of control that our, that our subject had 
about making those movements. And we could use a brain-computer interface in that sense to, to ask that question. And so we were able to show, and, and I think, well, that's kind of a question I throw but maybe back to, to, to both of you and also the audience, is what once we were able to see that there are signals in an area that's normally not linked to the sense of agency, because it was, if you want, simply an area to move that person's left arm. But what we could read from that area was actually a subjective sig signal whether that person wanted to move. And then you can, uh, and then the next step was that we were able to show in a brain computer interface if you include those subjective signals, purely internal if you want, nothing was observable when we decoded using this analysis, we could improve, we could make the system better. But the message maybe or an interesting point uh, just discovering cognitive liberty and, and related aspects here tonight is that in a way we accessed part of cognitive level, a mental form of cognitive liberty here and we can say well we use this to improve the movement and we can do so but of course the misuse or this, this, this window that you have said this is open now um, it's, it's very prominently open I think where you know if you take this example from decoding movement towards decoding thoughts or thinking, then, then this problem that you have described is of course massively there. And that's not science fiction, that's basically every person having a brain-computer interface, this should be possible because the manipulations we did, although the signals are complex and the analysis is simple, the kind of experiment that we did is, is rather simple. So I think misuse could be uh, uh, rather huge, um, um, although Yes, I mean, that's maybe a first uh, first comment in that direction. Marcello, you wanted to comment? Uh, no, uh, but, well, this is a fascinating experiment, and I had the uh, privilege of uh, reading some of the papers that were related to that. But uh, I, I wanted to um, say maybe a couple of things, if I'm allowed. The first one is in response to your question. I think this is a, raises a very interesting philosophical question, which is what, what does it mean to decode the brain? Um, after all, um, because we use this metaphor of decoding, you know, usually we say decoding means that you can basically transfer information from one code that is typically unknown to a code that is known. So, for example, if we decode uh, um, um, language, uh, ancient language that nobody knew before, uh, this means that we can basically uh, convert that language uh, that is unknown into a language that we understand like modern English. Um, and in that sense, we can decode the brain quite fully because we can establish quite reliable statistical associations that allows us to translate brain signals into mental information. Uh, what we cannot do is to decode the content, uh, especially the subjective content of those brain states. Um, so, and, and this is the, the very hard part, and some people are even skeptical that we will ever get there. Um, the second point uh, I wanted to, to highlight is that now we are having this discussion, uh, but I guess uh, this discussion can be perceived as a sort of niche debate among people who are working in this particular field of neuroscience. And this, I guess, uh, relates to the fact that the technologies that we're talking about and we saw in the movie are technologies that have a fairly limited degree of distribution, the societal distribution today. So they are accessible only to a certain uh, number of neurological and neuropsychiatric patients worldwide. Actually, too few, uh, because in, in many parts of the world, they do not have access to these technologies at all. Um, so I suspect maybe we can just do a quick survey. So how many people have ever used or seen uh, one of the technologies that you saw in the movie? Okay, this, this literally, okay, two hands. So it's extremely um, limited. But then if we ask people, how many people have a brain in this room? <laughs> um, I suspect everybody will raise their hands. And I think this is an important, <laughs> I think this is an important point to raise because the technology has a limited distribution. But, but still, those those tools that are now sold uh, for gaming, for example, EEG well, tools. So what uh, we are they are much you know the, the more accessible than 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 uh, of course what we saw in the movie. 
Yes, so Nita mentioned consumer neurotechnology, and this is uh, a field that is rapidly developing. So uh, neurotechnologies all originated in the clinical setting as technologies that can be therapeutic or assistive for people with neurological and psychiatric disorders. Um, then they're definitely used in, in research, as uh, Olaf explained. Um, but then this technology is also uh, moving outside of the clinics and outside of the labs onto uh, a variety of consumer applications. But I I think the debate on neuro rights is bigger than the debate on neurotechnologies. It's really about what rights uh, everyone on earth uh, should uh, be entitled to exercise in relation to the brains and minds. So even though you know the technology has limited distribution, the rights are already there. So for example, do you think you have a right to enhance your memory? So this is a question that so is you, you timely to ask. Yeah, you're touching the last point I wanted to raise before we give the, the floor uh, to you, actually, for questions. So prepare them. Is enhancement. How does enhancement, so enhancing the brain, so in, in physically sane persons, uh, not disabled, not sick, etc., using the same technologies to enhance the brain and uh, the, the, the things that the brain can do? Um, how far is that linked to, to the neural rights that, that you mentioned? It is very much linked to neural rights, in my view. Um, I tend to think that we tend to have a sort of negativity bias when we talk about the ethics of new technologies. So we always talk about what can possibly go wrong. Uh, and we tend to talk more about the ne negative side of it rather than the positive side. So also, a lot of discussion about neural rights, and uh, I, I bl claim guilty for this as well, uh, is about um, uh, you know protecting people uh, from the misuse of neurotechnology. Um, so for example, protecting people from having companies read their thoughts or the government uh, read their thoughts. But neural rights are also uh, positive rights in my view. So it's also about uh, what, um, um, what rights do I have in relation to, for example, enhancing my memory? Uh, do I have a right to enhance some cognitive uh, abilities of mine uh, if there is a technology that has the capability to do so? And, Personally, I tend to think that we may have some right to enhance, but this right should be uh, balanced against uh, other concurring rights uh, relating, for example, to equity um, and uh, um, just us, uh, and, and fair access to technology. Because, of course, uh, imagine that in five or ten years' time, we have a technology that is capable of making our kids smarter, so uh, boost executive function, memory, attention, and so on. Um, and, and then this technology is extremely effective, but it's very expensive. So only the kids of rich parents can access this technology. Uh, would you like to send your kids to a school where only uh, you know, the wealthy can uh, boost their memories and therefore get better performance and basically introduce in our society a new degree of inequality, not just socioeconomic inequality, but also a cognitive inequality that will s exacerbate this pre-existing socioeconomic inequality? And I think that's also a question that it's very timely to ask. Thank you very much. So um, may I ask some, some light uh, in, in the room so that you can have now the occasion to, uh, the opportunity to ask your questions, both to, uh, to our two uh, experts here and also to, of course, to Nita online. Um, do not hesitate, raise your hand. If there is one, yeah, here at the front row, please. Uh, here. Um, first of all, thank you very much for this very interesting uh, dialogue. Uh, two quick questions. One is, where would you put the boundaries between a data set and individual integrity? And second is, what would be the communal consequences of transhumanism? Is really the aggregate behavior of, let's say, that wave of, let's say, access to more information and analytical, um, let's say, uh, efficiency? Thank you. Would like to take this one, or Nita, yes, please do. First of all, wonderful questions. Um, I'm gonna start with the second one, which is the kind of questions of transhumanism. One aspect, and I think Marcello was touching on this idea a little bit with the questions of how do you think about justice. One question is, are there certain things that really society has a right to make determinations about? And one of them may be transhumanism. So for example, um, with neurotechnology, we've been talking about things like accessing the brain or enhancing the brain. We haven't really been talking about 
some of the things that you could do to, to gain, for example, traits um, that go beyond what it means to be human. For example, could you develop whisker sensing capabilities um, like rats and start to sense the world through an additional sense beyond those that we have? And if we could, if we can give people that sense, um, is that something that I as an individual get to decide whether or not I will become a transhumanist who has this whisker sense of capability or does society have a right to make those determinations? Um, I firmly believe society has a right to be uh, part of those conversations and um, part of the, the, the process of deciding not only what does it mean to be human, but are there limits um, on the kinds of uses and applications of technology and through a process of deliberative democracy, we can arrive at a place where we are comfortable with the responsible progress of science. With respect to the line between mental integrity and other data uses, this is probably one of the most challenging questions with respect to neurotechnology. So um, as, as Marcello said, this technology doesn't exist in isolation and the ways in which we can access and think about what's happening in your mind go well beyond neurotechnology, many of which are permissible inferences. One of the earliest skills that we develop as humans and that we try to cultivate as humans is theory of mind of others. Um, in fact, there are uh, neuroatypical disorders which really are built on the lack of the ability to have a theory of mind of others, of reading another person's mind. Clearly, we part of what it means to be human is trying to read each other's minds, understand what the other person is thinking, to be empathetic and to try to address that. And so where do we draw the line between that which we encourage, which is to try to encourage people to develop mind reading skills of others in order to be empathetic, to put ourselves into the shoes of others and to relate to one another versus an impermissible crossing into the mental integrity of another person. And the line isn't a bright one. Um, and the line will shift over time. And it's one that we as a society will have to define. But that's part of why trying to um, define too early rights and human rights law that are absolute rights can be deeply problematic. Because if we were to define, for example, freedom of thought to say, you can never read the mind of another person, then what we're doing every day uh, with one another would violate freedom of thought. And so we just have to be very careful as we think about these things to recognize part of what it means to be human is reading one another's minds, but there does come a point at which what you have done has gone beyond which uh, we are comfortable with as a society. You want to add something, or is, is there another question in the in the audience? Yes, one at the very back. Uh, thank <coughs> thanks a lot for the for the discussion. So I have two questions for Olaf. So the first is probably naive. So how do you deal with consent related to patients who cannot communicate? Um, how do you get their consent for, for this? And the second one is related to language. So basically, even during the documentary, it was shown that perhaps technology can help us interpret signals to language, but in, in, in my opinion, I mean, part of the human experience is, to, is that struggle exactly to find the words because we know language is limited and then we go to creative ways like music or metaphor or poetry to express thoughts that cannot be necessarily confined within words. So how do you sort of deal with this um, language limitation in your technical field? Thanks. Yeah, let me start with a with the second question. So compared to, I think, the very simple and rudimentary movements to establish, to re-establish a communication I think there was the example of the person re reaching for the for the cup uh, that was shown with this robotic arm, um, and already seeing that that is quite complex to achieve with a neuroprosthetic device and a brain computer interface. One idea was: can we simplify to use and decode directly language? So, for example, yes, no, which is done by some brain computer interfaces. Is <laughs> Is, is, is a very simple form of language again, but then building on this even more complex system. So in that sense, in order to communicate, um, an advantage of language is there, but, and not yet getting to your point of complexity, language, I think we can agree, is so much more complex than even those, those movements I'm, you know, we, we all can easily do with our hands. And there are actually several groups 
pursuing this um, with a lot more electrodes. So one study, for example, that came out last year has a, has a grid of about 160 electrodes not implanted into the brain, but on top of the brain, between the bone and the brain, and they are training with computer algorithms. They're really, per, per, uh, pay, uh, per for each individual patient, they're decoding really a set of 60 to 100 words that can be arranged, and so it's replacing the keyboard I in a way. It's almost like the dream of, of, of Elon Musk, let's, let's say, one of the dreams, maybe. So in that sense, language is already a lot more complex, but of course what you say is also true. Language, I mean, it, it is really the most opposite to poetry you, 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 you can imagine, right? It's like a list of 50 words so that people can um, have a very basic form of communication. But of course the dream, let's say, of, of, of applying this to, to more people outside the clinic is will then be uh, uh, much, much larger as, as one response. And then to the first question, of course, this is uh, strictly regulated. so should the person not be able to uh, uh, communicate, then there is maybe someone in the family. In our case, the patient was able to speak, so he could use, because the, the damage was very high, just below uh, his, his spinal cord, so, so, so the nerves and the, the, the brain centers to, 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 to produce language, were, they were intact in this case. But um, uh, in a, to turn that question around, I think establishing um, um, communication, which, which in, in tetraplegic patients is, is one form, in the chronic form, but also after uh, severe injuries to establish a first contact and even to, uh, there is for example ways where people have to up or down regulate, are trained to do that in order for example to, to let the patient decide with a yes no response whether uh, life uh, prolonging procedures are continued or not. So I think having a form of communication in people who are not able to speak or indicate or eye bl use eye blinks is, is, is very important. But of course, the, the, the question you raise is, is an important one, the first one. Thanks. Your thoughts? Yeah. If go I on. may just allow, um, add, um, um, go back to the previous question about transhumanism. Um, I, I think that, that's a very important question, uh, which resonates a lot with the title of this movie. Mm -hmm. um, and here, probably, uh, I beg to disagree with the people who chose the title for this movie, because I think. Um, uh, Phil Kennedy was a fantastic scientist, uh, definitely a pioneer in the field, uh, but I hardly believe he was the father of the cyborg, because I suspect the father of the cyborg was some um, homo sapiens who lived probably 100,000 years ago in uh, Western Africa, in the sense that um, our species, um, we are all natural born cyborgs. Uh, we have been manipulating the environment around us and creating artifacts um, since the very beginning of uh, our speciation process. Um, and our cultural evolution is basically a uh, history of becoming cyborgs. Uh, we started manipulating artifacts and then at some point we invented, um, uh, we, we developed verbal language. Uh, several thousand years later we developed uh, writing and so on. And then if we look at today, you know, there are hundreds of thousands of people who are going around the world with things like prosthetic arms or um, cochlear implants um, and all sorts of technologies that make us cyborgs. So I think the definition um, of, of, of what it is to be a cyborg, you know, and, and the kind of human machine interaction that we establish is not a static, but it's a dynamic one. And I, I think this also provides the best justification for what Nita just said, that also our uh, normative reflection in terms of ethics and law uh, cannot be static, but needs to be dynamic. Mm -hmm. Is there another question in the audience? Yes, please. Suppose that we are able to read uh, the, the brain. Is it, a, could have possibility the brain refuse the communication? Because I'm not sure that the human right will be ever respected. Sorry, is uh, so it, was it the sure question we, we of whether understand. or not humans, it, so was the question whether or not humans could um, 
thwart it, right? So if, if we could, were, are there countermeasures? Is that the question, or is, was the question yeah. different? Is the, is the can we uh, uh, can the brain protect itself against um, reading or writing something in its brain? Yeah. Yeah, it's an uh, excellent, excellent question. So I think it's going to be very difficult once, first of all, at the moment, yes. But once there is a long-term relationship that is established and the technology is inside, taking this away uh, is, 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 is going to change something fundamental. And if the brain, the brain normally adapts to many things, so it will ad adapt to many of these and integrate many of these new devices. So in the end, it will be really in the cyborg way completely integrated. And at that point, it's not something that you can just veto or step away from. Like this example I mentioned too, too briefly about cognitive liberty and how we try to understand this. So the manipulations that we were doing just for like these two sessions on two days, um, for, for the patient, when we ask him afterwards, of course he sometimes felt the kind of manipulations we were doing, but there was also a level where, you, where you're not able to have more insight. Actually, you probably have less insight into some of these mechanisms, <coughs> let's say of somebody outside controlling the device. So in my opinion, it will be very uh, difficult to sabotage it or to stop it without on one side losing something that you may have gained with the neurotechnology, but it has really become part of your brain, maybe to an extent. Could I give just an, a quick example in, in response to that? Um, so I think that's absolutely right that, it, you know, in today's technology, you might have the ability to thwart it, but once it becomes part of technology you're using to interface with everything else, if you're wearing it like you wear um, a Fitbit or something like that, um, it will be very difficult to uh, to be able to not have your thoughts or activities decoded um, at a time that matters. And here's just a, a brief example. There's a, a murder trial that's happening in the United States right now. Um, and the alibi of the person um, who is on trial for the for the murder um, has been challenged based on the Fitbit data that they were wearing. Um, the person claimed that they were inactive at the time, that they were asleep, but their Fitbit data showed that they were actively engaged um, in activity at the time, uh, thereby undermining their, their claims of credibility. You could imagine how much more powerful that will be when you're wearing neurotechnology at all times that can be decoded in much more sophisticated ways, or you have implanted technology that can be decoded um, in a very specific time period when you want to be able to interpret what that information means. So I think the passive integration into your everyday life will make it very difficult to have it be something that you um, implement countermeasures against. Yes. And I fully agree both with uh, Nita and Olaf. And I think uh, on top of that, there is also an additional problem, which is that any countermeasure you can possibly implement um, is a conscious measure. Um, and here, we have a problem because um, the information that you can record from the brain, it's not all about conscious processes, but also about uh, subconscious and unconscious processes. Um, so, you know, our friends in cybersecurity like to say that the best antivirus is the brain. And by that, they mean, you know, that the best way for you to avoid a, a vi computer virus is to think about you know where uh, which website you visit, um, and that works way best, uh, way better than any um, antivirus on the market. Uh, so it's your conscious control of your action that it's your your best uh, weapon to protect yourself. But when it comes to um, reading uh, brain activity, it's very hard to seclude unconscious from conscious information. And so exercising this conscious uh, rational filter, it's uh, it's very difficult. Any further question in, in the audience? Yes, madame. Oui, j'aurais voulu revenir au film et vous demander à tous ce que vous aviez pensé de l'expérience de Phil Kennedy sur lui-même. On voit dans le film que ça suscite des réactions diverses et lui répond chaque fois, c'est mon cerveau, j'en fais ce que j'en veux. Pour moi, il y a quelque chose qui n'est pas très clair quand il... 
quand il fait cette expérience sur les, sur les autres, notamment sur le patient qui s'appelle Eric pour lui redonner la parole, on, on voit l'utilité thérapeutique, même si c'est un échec au final. Mais quand il s'implante la, la puce à, à lui-même, euh, ce n'est pas très clair pour moi pourquoi il le fait et quels sont les résultats concrets. À la fin, il dit si c'était à refaire, je le referais. Alors, je voulais savoir en vous, en tant que spécialiste, ce que vous en pensiez, si vous l'approuviez ou pas. Merci. Nita, did you get it? No. no. So it was about the, the movie, uh, the self-experimentation of uh, Phil Kennedy on, on himself. Why, why yeah. do that? Because uh, on Eric, the patient, it's obvious, it's to help him. But why on, right. on him? So I don't know who wants to start. We talked about this over dinner. Yes, <laughs> that's why. <laughs> um, I think Nita wants to go first. Nita? No, no, go ahead, go ahead. If you talked about it over dinner, I, I, since I missed the dinner, I'd it's like a, to hear It's a very complex first. issue. We had a long discussion over dinner, that's why. Well, well so this is a very interesting um, topic um, in ethics because it, it generates a very simple ethical dilemma, right? On, on the one end, you, you would argue, well, there is um, uh, freedom of science, uh, and uh, a, a researcher should have the right to pursue research that does not harm any other person. Um, and so uh, doing the experiments on himself in this particular case, uh, it does not violate um, any consent because he's authorizing these interventions to himself and there is no harm to others. Um, so um, a lot of people would argue there is nothing ethically wrong with this. Uh, but there are also some people more on the conservative side of, uh, uh, of ethics who argue that uh, self-experimentation can actually degrade science uh, because it is, first of all, methodologically questionable because basically, anytime you do self-experimentation, your statistical sample equals one, because uh, you're the only uh, person in the sample. Um, so there is a high risk of confounding bias. Um, also, there is, the research is not conducted independently by somebody else, so there's also a problem of objectivity. Um, and then uh, there are also some people who would argue that um, even if something is uh, consented to and does not generate harm to others, um, we should not authorize it if it generates harm to the individual person. So for example, uh, Kennedy was using, especially um, when he was uh, getting his um, uh, latest self-implant, uh, quite um, obsolete technology. Um, so Olaf was uh, explaining to me over dinner that there were way better technologies available at that time. Um, so if that was done on any other patient, no ethics committee would have uh, allowed that because this would not meet the requirement of the best standard of care. Uh, but since he did that to himself, he basically exploited this, uh, this regulatory gap. Is there one last question maybe in the audience because we shortly have to close this debate? Yes, please. Oui, désolé, je me permets de parler en français parce que mon anglais, est... déjà que je ne maîtrise pas toutes ces questions, dès qu'il y a des machines, euh, je préfère parler en français. En fait, euh, je, tout ce débat est extrêmement complexe et je ne sais pas si je vais ajouter une complexité à la chose, mais il y a beaucoup de machines et donc il y a de l'électricité. Et on ne parle jamais, et l'électricité pose quand même des questions, toute la question de l'énergie, et c'est une question politique, climatique et éthique, et on arrive, je ne veux pas sortir du titre, aux droits humains. Euh, Qu'avez-vous à dire par rapport à ça Do you mind just, I, so my French is a little rusty, so just translate that last part. I understood that she was talking about the... Um, the use of electricity and... and Peut-être uh, je laisse l'animateur... Yeah, all, all, the all the materials needed to, to produce those implants, to feed them with energy, be that bater batteries or electricity, etc. Um, and comes to, to the general questions of, you know, uh, resources, climate, etc. and human yeah. rights at the end. Let me, let me uh, take it on from a slightly different perspective for a moment, which is to say, Obviously, one of the greatest threats facing humanity is um, climate change. One of the greatest causes of suffering worldwide is um, suffering from neurological impairment and disease. Uh, and 
I believe that there is an ethical mandate to be able to address the wide scale suffering from um, neurological impairment and disease. You might also believe that we're also limited in many ways in our capabilities today. Um, this is you know, kind of what Elon Musk has argued and also what um, some technologists who are developing technology to harness the electrical activity in the brain um, are arguing, which is we can do a lot more than we currently are able to do, um, the ordinary person, the healthy person. Uh, we're slow in our typing and in our communication of ideas. We are slow in our ability to operate so much of the world around us. Um, and we could do that by harnessing the capabilities of the brain. So I think, um, I think the question always with these technologies is how do you do so? How do you develop the technologies in a way that is that recognizes the profound impact, the technological innovation, and that everything that we're doing as humans right now is causing us to be in such a profound moment of climate change. But if ever there was an area where I think that there is an ethical mandate to proceed and to find a way to do so responsibly, it's in an area that is so fundamentally tied to what it means to be human and where there is such both great impairment and disease, which calls for the study of the brain and technologies to improve the experience, but also in an age of artificial intelligence where harnessing the power of the brain is going to become ever more important for humans to be able to truly flourish. So without a doubt, we need to do it responsibly and in an environmentally conscious way, but it's an area where we ought to proceed. Thank you very much, uh, Nita. I think it's time to, to close this debate, but before that, I'd like to come to a short conclusion. Actually, you stole it <laughs> from me, Marcello, because you're mentioning this evolution path, right? And it's also mentioned in the movie. We, we hear about, um, we hear from Phil Kennedy saying something like, I wrote it down, but it's maybe wrong. Implanting our brain to en enhance them is part of the evolution of the human race. And, um, Someone even says that the, the BCI, the so-called brain-computer interfaces, are a real crucial tipping point in, in that. So you already answered, but what is your answer, um, uh, Olaf? Is, is that, I mean, it, is everything that we've seen or discussed tonight part of the human evolution, normal one? Um, or how, how do you see it? And then I'll well, come back to you. Time Nita. Will, will tell. M maybe I think it's it's an early phase. There's a handful of patients, maximally, who really have been been studied in in different centers. Um, there is no scaling in inside yet on the invasive part. On the other hand, we you know the the potential use of the non-invasive brain computer interfaces could be very large. It's commercial. It's it's. So, so I think it, it remains to be seen, like five years, ten years, twenty years from now, how, how this uh, is developing. I, uh, one, one, maybe conclusion from my side that I take when looking at this is that both has to develop very closely together. So, a strong neuroethics at the same time, closely together with these developments. I think in a, in a, in a, in a discussion among scientists, like, like also like this this discussion today, I think is very important so that. We don't have, or we don't, or we try to avoid similar mistakes that have maybe done by the Internet of Things, by by social media, or by by by, by nuclear energy uh, um, advances uh, in the last century. So, so the hope would be forward-looking, positive, that we can um, develop new therapies for these terrible diseases we talked about, while also avoiding or trying to minimize from the beginning and make people aware of the risks uh, at hand. Nita, final word is yours. Thank you. So um, th this is a topic of a book that I'm writing that will be out in the beginning of 2023 called The Battle for Your Brain. Um, and really, I think the focus of my book is to try to say, this is coming. Um, the, the technology is going to be much more widespread than people believe and understand. While only a couple of members of the audience today have engaged with this technology, um, the consumer applications of this technology and the um, requirements of adopting this technology in order to be able to interface with all other technology is coming. Um, and that will bring with it a host of exciting new opportunities for humans and be able to address a lot of human suffering. Um, but it introduces a risk that we never before have faced as a society, a transformation of what it means to 
relate to one another and also a threat, particularly um, you know, profound in this moment as, as Marcello started his comments, as we see the atrocities of war, but also the atrocities of human rights violations and um, the lengths to which we will go to cause the suffering of others, this can be a tool of oppression as well. And so the time is now to define um, the responsible progress of this technology and to embrace a future with this technology, um, but very firmly with boundaries that recognize our right to cognitive liberty. So thank you very much, Nita Farhani, and have a, a very nice end of day in the, in the US. Thanks to Thank both you. of you as well, uh, Olaf Blanke and Marcello Yenka. Can you ask her to stay to make a, a photo? Y yes, so please stay uh, for a while, Nita. We'll make a, a photograph. And thanks to the organizers of uh, this evening. Uh, please do stand up for the, <laughs> for the photo. I think it's, it's to you. Yeah, uh, no, all of you. With, uh, all of us. So we stay on stage? Yes. yes. No, you. Oh, we stand just stand. Up. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, the next pair of